Joseph, a miracle child, is about to be born in Canaan. Let us join his father Jacob as he awaits his son's birth. Jacob paces in the darkness, listening for any slight sound. His family settlement is still as his other sons wait too for the newborn's cry. Jacob wonders what could be taking so long. Judah, one of Jacob's older sons, watches his father fondly. <laughs> Look at yourself, father. You would think this was your first child. Tell me, were you this nervous when I was born? Well, yes and no. It was different with your mother. But with Rachel, we gave up hope. We were told she could never have children. Just then, a baby's cry rises in the night. My boy. As Joseph grows, Jacob reminds him again and again, Joseph's life will always be different from his brother's lives. Their work is with the sheep herd. Joseph's work is with his studies. Joseph, God has a plan and a purpose for you. You're not like the rest of us. So while his half-brothers play ball, Joseph studies the scrolls. While the others tend the sheep, Joseph practices his writing. And while his brother's backs are bare to the hot sun, Joseph wears a new coat. With loving hands, Rachel has woven threads of blue and gold and red into a coat that shows how Joseph has been set apart. When Joseph tries to join his brother's work or games, they want no part of him. To them, Joseph is spoiled. He is their father's favorite son. Judah! Simeon! What are you doing here? Don't you have some scrolls to read or something? The brothers hurt and anger grow when Joseph tells them of his recent dream. Come on, Joseph, tell us. We're dying to hear about it. Joseph says that first he dreamed that he and his brothers brought sheaves of wheat to a field. As Joseph watched, his brother's wheat bowed down to him. Then Joseph dreamed that he saw 11 stars and the sun and the moon bow down to him. We can't ignore these dreams. There could be a message here. The brothers do not like these dreams. Joseph seems to think he is higher and mightier than any of them. I've had enough of this. Don't get mad at me. I didn't ask for them. Joseph, <laughs> boys, apologize to each other. Worse yet, their own father seems to think that Joseph's dream is a sign of great things to come for his favorite son. Joseph's brothers become so jealous that they begin to plot against him. One day, Joseph overhears their harsh plans. His brothers slowly surround him. Hey, everybody, the little spy is back. I'm spying. I just Did wanted to- Did father tell you to check up on no, us? No, maybe this was a mistake. I, I just want to- Report on us to father? You look at scrolls all day while we're covered in sweat. Why is that, Joseph? Is it because we don't have pretty coats like you? They back Joseph into a deep pit and leave him there. Joseph cries out for their help, but his brothers do not answer. Somebody, please, don't leave me here alone. Alone and afraid, Joseph watches the sunlight fade into darkness. As he huddles against the rough wall of the pit, a rope lowers in front of him. Joseph grabs it and climbs out, certain that his brothers will be waiting. But at the top of the pit, Slave traders seize Joseph and tie his hands. Hey, hey, what are you doing? Ow, let me go. You don't understand, I'm from the house of Jacob. Again, Joseph cries out for his brother's help. His brothers come forward, but only to accept the silver that the traders pay them. Joseph realizes with horror that his brothers have sold him. No, help me. Judah, Judah, help me, please. Judah, we can't turn back now. We've gone too far. I'm your brother! I'm your brother! Half brother. The traders bring Joseph to the slave market in Egypt. He is sold to Potiphar, Pharaoh's captain of the guard. He'll do. 
Potiphar's servant dresses Joseph as an Egyptian so that he will fit into Pharaoh's world. Joseph takes care of his master's fields and vineyards and household. Joseph succeeds at all he does, proving to Potiphar again and again that he is a wise and trustworthy servant. You've done well. What's your name? Joseph. Joseph, you're an educated slave. Where did you learn? My father taught me. He taught you well. Potiphar's wife, Zuleika, also comes to notice and admire Joseph. She asks her husband to allow Joseph to work for her in the banquet hall. There, Joseph meets Osanoth, Zuleika's kind and beautiful niece. Joseph becomes more than a servant in Potiphar's household. He is treated like a member of the family with all of its privileges and duties. Joseph is pleased with his new life, but he still thinks of his parents and brothers in Canaan. To keep them close in heart, Joseph paints a mural of his homeland. One night, as Joseph works on the mural, Zuleika visits him. She wants Joseph to betray Potiphar's trust in him. No, this is not Joseph, right. look at me. No, I, I, will, I will not betray my master. To you. When Joseph refuses, Zuleika pretends that he has harmed her. As Joseph runs away, Zuleika screams for Potiphar and lies about what Joseph has done. No other slave was ever given this opportunity. I gave you my trust. What do you say to yourself? It's not what it seems. I could never betray you, master. Such insolence! Am I to believe a slave over my own wife? I swear I did nothing to betray you. Silence! Potiphar has Joseph thrown into prison. Joseph pleads with his master to believe that he is innocent. But the only ones who hear his pleas are his fellow prisoners and the rats that scurry in the darkness. Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker share Joseph's prison cell. One morning, the cupbearer tells Joseph about a strange dream he had. Joseph listens carefully. He comforts the cupbearer with his understanding of the dream. The cupbearer will soon be released. In three days, Pharaoh will bring you back to the palace, a free man. The baker then tells Joseph his dream, hoping for equally good news. But Joseph must tell the baker that his dream has a grim meaning. In three days, he will die. Three days later, both prisoners learn that Joseph was right. They are taken away, and Joseph is left alone in the cell. Tell Pharaoh about me. I will. <clears throat> Don't forget me! No one seems to remember that Joseph is in the prison or that he exists at all. Guard! Tell them I'm still here! Answer me! <sighs> no one cares. The silent darkness of the prison crushes Joseph's spirit. In anger and despair, Joseph shouts at God. Why has God given him so much, only to take it away? Joseph cannot understand. God, why are you doing this to me? Do you hear me? Any kindness you take away. You were the one who gave me the dreams. You brought me the gift. Some gift. My dreams are lies. What have I done to deserve this? Then Joseph notices a small tree that has somehow found enough light to grow in the prison. Joseph nurtures the tree and watches it become stronger and taller. He realizes that he too can grow if he just trusts in God. Although Joseph remains a prisoner, his faith sets his spirit free. One day, the door to the prison creaks open. As Joseph blinks in the bright light, he is summoned to the palace. Pharaoh has learned of Joseph's gift for explaining dreams. Weary from two dreams that torment him, Pharaoh commands Joseph to tell him their meaning. In Pharaoh's dreams, Joseph sees Egypt's dark future. After a period of plenty, Egypt will suffer a great famine. Pharaoh's dreams are one. The healthy cows and ears of grain are seven years of abundance. But the sickly cows and the withered grain mean seven years of famine will follow and destroy the land. 
Egypt may not survive. Pharaoh asks Joseph how he might avoid the coming famine. Joseph explains that if Pharaoh prepares now, he will keep his people from starving later. You must find a man you can trust. During the years of plenty, have him collect one-fifth of the grain from every field and store it under guard. Then during the years of famine, give it back to the people. Joseph's words give Pharaoh hope. Pharaoh entrusts the future of his land to Joseph and tells all of Egypt that Joseph is second now only to Pharaoh. As Joseph foresaw, Egypt has seven years of plenty. Under Joseph's direction, great storehouses are built to set aside portions of the harvest. These plentiful years are happy ones for Joseph. Osanah, who cared for him and fed him while he was in prison, works by his side. In time, they marry and have two children. But in the eighth year, drought withers the land. Joseph carefully rations grain and keeps many from starving. As news of Egypt's storehouses spreads, people from faraway lands come to buy grain. One day, Joseph is shocked to see his brothers in line. Who's next? We are, my lord. You are not Egyptian. No, sir. My brothers and I have traveled far from Canaan. Please, our wives and children are hungry. I'm sorry, but you haven't contributed to our supply. We don't ask for charity. We'll pay you with silver. He does not reveal who he is to his brothers, but Joseph forbids his men to sell any grain to the brothers. Are you thieves hoping to see where we store our grain? Spies? I don't know what you are, but I don't believe your story. Joseph tells them that if they wish to buy grain, they must return with the young brother they say they have left in Canaan. Produce this youngest brother. But why? What would that prove? That you're not lying. If you're telling the truth, I will let you buy all the grain you want. Until then, arrest this one. We'll hold him until you produce this youngest brother. Take him. Come on. Stop! Judah! Oh, help me! No! No! Let's go! No! Osana does not understand Joseph's harsh actions. Bowed in sorrow and anger, Joseph confesses that the Canaanites are his brothers, the brothers who betrayed him. When his brothers return from Canaan, Joseph questions Benjamin, who was born to Rachel and Jacob after they lost Joseph. As the brothers exchange guilty looks, Joseph learns that they have lied to Jacob and Rachel about his death. He also sees that Benjamin is precious to Jacob, just as Joseph once was. So, Benjamin, tell me of your, your mother and father. My mother is no longer alive. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. And your father? He's worried I'm here. Why is that? I'm a long way from home. Oh? Doesn't he trust your brothers to protect you? He likes me to stay close by. Mm, really? Why is that? A long time ago, he, he lost his youngest son. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. How did that happen? He was killed. Killed? How? By wolves. Wolves? Yes. It broke my father's heart. Well, it must have been very hard on your brothers, too. They never speak of it. Don't they? Still, Joseph does not reveal himself to his brothers. Abruptly, he tells the brothers that they are welcome to share in a feast. While the others eat and drink, Joseph bitterly observes the brotherly love they had never shared with him and makes a plan to repay his brothers for what they had done to him. After the feast, Joseph orders his guards to seize his brothers. Osana watches her husband in horror as he accuses his brothers of stealing from him. The brothers do not understand. One by one, the sacks of grain that Joseph had given them are opened. From Benjamin's sack, Joseph's royal goblet falls to the ground. One of you has stolen from me. The favored one. I didn't take it. Arrest him. Just 
For what you have done, you will be punished. Someone put it in there. Joseph orders his guards to take away the young boy. As Benjamin fearfully struggles against the guard, Joseph sees himself, years before, struggling against the slave traders. The brothers beg Joseph to take one of them in Benjamin's place. Stop! Take me instead, I, I beg you. No, take me. Take me, take me. No, you can't, take, take me. Take any of us, your grace, but please, let the boy go. But Joseph pretends not to understand their concern. The brothers look to one another in shame. Finally, Judah confesses that their jealousy led them to destroy another brother's life many years ago. You would sacrifice yourselves for a half-brother who's spoiled by your father? Yes. Why? Why should you care if I take him, <laughs> beat him, make him a slave? Because I will not make my father suffer again. Again? What do you mean, again? Our brother was not killed by wolves. We were blinded by jealousy and sold him into slavery. We can't go back without the boy. My father could not bear it a second time, and neither could we. If anyone is to be punished, it should be us. Now it is Joseph's turn to feel shame. His desire for revenge drains away, and he tells the brothers he will not harm them or his own father. The brothers gasp as Joseph takes off his Egyptian headdress and reveals himself. Judah asks Joseph to forgive them. Joseph tells his brothers that he already has. Now it is his turn to ask their forgiveness. Oh, Joseph, can you ever forgive us? I already have. Can you forgive me for thinking I was some miracle from God? But you are a miracle. God sent you to save our family and all of Egypt, and you did. Joseph invites his brothers and their families to live with him in Egypt. His brothers return to Canaan to tell their families and Jacob the good news. Patiently, Joseph waits with Osanah and their children for their return. When Joseph sees their caravan arrive from Canaan, he runs to his elderly father. Joseph! Father! Father! <laughs> Father! Joseph! My, my boy. Your mother prayed this day would come, that we'd all be together again as a family. It's a miracle. Yes, Father. It is a miracle. As he holds his father close, Joseph sees God's plan for love and forgiveness unfold. It has saved the lives of many Egyptians, and it has saved Joseph's family.